Volunteer at IGNCA with the collaboration of Nadi Sambad Prakal of IGNCA. Uh, just uh, before beginning this session, I was just like because since I was reading a lot about Laleshwari Devi, so I just want to wish mention the uh, this this image which is there on the board, Laleshwari Devi, who's a, who is a mystic, known as the mystic of Kashmir. Her lalwak are very much popular, and the lalwak actually she wrote in the 14th century. Those lalwak provide guided the society, and these lalwak inspired so much to the Sufis, so-called Sufi poets of that time, that they started to copy those lalwak. They started to mug it up in their life also. So uh, just. These couple, after these couple of lines, I would like to uh, welcome you all and uh, before starting this session, following the same legacy of the uh, women empowerment, ins uh, inspiring from uh, Laleshwari Devi, I would like to welcome the chair, honorary guest. We are uh, having, the first guest we are having Professor C. Upendra Rao, a gold medalist from Center of Sanskrit Studies, GNU, Delhi. To say something about you, sir, is just like to show a lamp to the, um, to the sun, but uh, I dare to say a few lines about you. Uh, he's a man who is having a lot of awards, a lot of books in his credit. Apart from being a chairperson of Center of Sanskrit Studies at JNU, he was a visiting professor on ICCR in Cambodia. He's an author of 20 books. And uh, the list is not close even yet. He's also a receiver of many distinguished and renowned national and international awards. So I welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Can you please clap your hands to welcome him? Thank you so much. Uh, as a coach here, we are having Professor Madan Lal Goel. He is basically, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. He's a professor Emirates of political science, director of uh, international studies, University of West Florida, Dr. Goel. Uh, is also a philosopher, a, a, a distinguished faculty. He worked a lot and experienced his views on Indian caste system, dowry debts, which quite, which is quite uh, fascinating, and uh, children begging, especially the children begging and the girls' issues. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of Waves. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as a main speaker, we are having Dr. Kunrat Els. Uh, so please join us. He's a scholar of Indology in Belgium. And uh, I think without taking much time, uh, I should call our first speaker. First speaker, Dr. Shakuntala. Dr. Shakuntala from Guwahati. Uh, Dr. Shakuntala is an associate professor in Department of Philosophy in Guwahati University, and she is going to express her views on representative of Indian womanhood in Ramayana, making tradition. Uh, Dr. Shakuntala.
that are available in Ramayana, I have tried to, to break them up according to their dwelling. The first one are the forest dwellers. Then there are the queens and the princes of Ayodhya. Then there is a queen of Iskindra. And last of all, there are the ladies of Lanka. When we look into the forest dwellers, the first one, lady that comes to the mind is Anasuda. And when we look into her, we find that she has been <coughs> considered to be very caring and concerned about the welfare of the people. So it is said, a selfless lady using the power earned by her hard ascetism to remove suffering of the people around her. When land was affected by drought and people were suffering from lack of food and water, it was Anasuya who with her power made, power made the fruit grow and water flow to their side. So she is the lady who is concerned about the others. She is an ascetic, there is no doubt about it, but it is a concern about the others or the welfare about the others which actually strike us. And her husband, Atri, actually says about her, the people were ceaselessly burning in consequence of a drought extending over 10 years. O sinless one, that one resembling your mother exists, by whom furnished with rigid asceticism and adorned with voluntary penances, were created fruits and roots, and Janavi was made to flow through the asylum, by whom were performed mighty austerities for 10,000 years in virtue of whose finances Disturbances to asceticism of the sages ceased, by whom ten nights were brought within the compass of a single one. So she is the one who is thinking about other people, the welfare. Then we also have the character of Shavari, who remember her. Now when we look into Shavari, she is not just an ascetic because of which we remember her. When I, when I try to find what makes her so special to me. I find that it is the faith and the reverence to the preceptors. In other words, it is a devotion that we can find in her that makes her so special. Actually, it is a woman in herself, in relation, but not because somebody did something to her, not because of the situations, but it is she in herself which makes her so special. Ramayana tells of Shavari that all Savari of accomplished asceticism and recognized by the Siddhas. So she is recognized. She is also recognized as virtuous. Those greatest ascetics, cognizant of virtue, said to me, Rama shall come to your holy asylum. Do you receive with great reverence the guest together with Lakshmana? She is the faithful one. So we not only find her to be the recognized ascetic, we not only find her to be the virtuous one, we also find her listening to her preceptors. Her preceptors told her that when Rama will come, that she will be benefited, and she then can go to heaven to meet the preceptors themselves. So we find in the Ramayana being said, being thus addressed and ordered by Rama, Savari wearing matted locks, rags and the skin of an antelope, surrendered herself to fire and rose high up in the welkin like, bla like to blazing fire. So what we find in the Shavari is her devotion to the preceptors. 
So what is attracting us to Shavari is a faith in the preceptors, the devotion. It doesn't matter exactly to whom she is devoted. It doesn't matter to whom actually she is having faith and reverence to. But it is the character, it is the strength of the faith and reverence in Shavari that actually we find so appealing in her. Ahalla is a character which has attracted attention of the common people, including us. And we always see her as having the shortcoming. And even Ramayan tells actually that she does have a shortcoming. And she is, uh, she, her understanding is not very clear. And as the story goes, she knew that she was approached by Indra in the guise of her husband. But she agreed to the seduction of Indra because she also had the desire and she was uh, conceited about her beauty. So she, so she gave in. And then Gautama cursed her. But what comes as striking in Ahalya is not her downfall, but her ability to accept the punishment that came to her when Gautama cursed her. She didn't reply. She didn't try to defend. She took it, and she rose up again. That is like a phoenix. She, she can rise up again. It is the strength of Ahalya that she can come up. That she can rise again, that I feel is what is so attractive about her. When Gautama say, this very thousand years you shall pass feeding upon air without food, snagged in asceticism in the dust, and you shall remain in this hermitage unseen of any. <clears throat> Ministering to him the rites of hospitality with a mind free from ignorance and covetousness, you shall be in your own form with joy, regain my side. And with collected mind she gave them water for their feet as well as archaea and extended to them the rites of hospitality. That she has the power to bear the punishment, she didn't blame anyone, she didn't try to defend, but she rose up again. Within her own faults, she has the power, she has the capability to rise up. These are the forest ladies we <coughs> These were the forest ladies we talked about. The other one is from Kiskindha, Tara. And in her I found that it is the intelligence, pragmatism, and the common sense which is so attractive. And we find a story in the story that when Sugriva comes to Bali after being defeated by Bali in the battle and says that come out Bali and fight with me, it is Tara who says that, do not go out. Because Sugriva must be having some other support to come just after the battle which he lost. And now, again, trying to call him out for the combat. We find their saying to Bali, formerly this Sugriva invited you angrily to battle and being defeated and wounded by you fled away. That one who had been defeated and harassed by you formerly is now calling you. Indeed, it has excited my fear. So when Bali wanted to go out, it is Tara who saw the danger and said that, please do not go out. It doesn't behove you to yield to the influence of Ayr, your conflict with that son of King of Koshala, gifted with the prowess of Chakra, will not conduce to your welfare. And it is Tara who understood that Bali should be friendly with Rama and not inimical towards him. So it is Tara's common sense. And it is Bali who describes Tara. Surashena's daughter is wonderfully expert in ascertaining subtle things and giving counsels at a time of danger. Do you, without the least doubt, perform what shall the chaste lady instruct you to do? So even Bali told the letter that she is intelligent and she is somebody who is pragmatic and can advise in situations. And she also come across as a lady, not only who, who is defending her husband, not only as the one who is caring of her husband, but also the one who can appease the anger of Lakshmana. 
when Shukriva was busy with Atara and his other wife, and he was not trying to help her Rama, and Rama was why he sent Lakshmana, then to appease the anger of Lakshmana, it is again Tara who has been sent by Shukriva. So she has the quality. And she says to Lakshmana, O oh Prince, who accomplishes with excellent virtues, gets enraged with one of inferior merits. O oh Prince, who like you, an offspring of asceticism, is worked up with ire against the virtues of forgiveness. So she's trying to convince that Lakshmana, that he's not supposed to get angry with Shukriva. He's just a monkey. Do you forgive that Lord of Monkeys race, your brother influenced by carnality, who is by you and who, through the urgency of lust, has banished shame? Even Maharshi's finding delight in religion as asceticism, setting their hearts upon satisfying lust, become fast bound by ignorance. And she said it convincingly because Lakshmana's anger did get appeased. Then when we go to the queens and the princes of Ayodhya, what I find uh, interesting is that being the queen, they are under restrictions. They do not come forth as independent women, rather they come forth as women who can work out what they want within restrictions. When one is a royalty, one is under restriction. So the first characteristic and the most interesting characteristic is Kirke. And um, we do not exactly like her. And nobody, I think, uh, picks uh, the daughter's name as Kirke. But if we really go into Kirke's character, what struck me as, uh, as interesting is her desire for self-preservation. She was the most important of the queens. And she wanted to maintain that importance. And a queen cannot do it except through her husband and through her son. That was the only means available to Kirke, and she utilized it. There was nothing bad or good about Kirke's behavior. At least I, I don't find it exactly to be so. What I find is her desire for self-preservation. Of course, comes also the desire or her love for her child. And when we talk about Kaike, we say it, your co-wife Rama's mother had formerly through pride and good fortune been slighted by you. Why will not she, upon you, wreck her revenge? So she's trying to be convinced by Mantara that she should banish Rama because otherwise she will lose the crown. And it is, uh, I will leave out Kaike because basically that is what I'm trying to say. We come to the next lady, that is Koshalya. And Koshalya, of course, loves her son, but the characteristic comes forth as more as a lamentation. Those who serve me or are obedient to me shall not even speak with me when they will see the son of Kaikeyi. She is always fretful temper. How shall I reduce it to misery? I, the face of Kaikeyi. So she also, like Kaikeyi, has only one way, either her husband or her son, to protect her. We do not find much about her saying good things about her son, but rather it is more about how to preserve herself. Then it is the Sumitra of all the queens, which I find to be the most noble of all, because on one hand, to Lakshmana she is advising that she, he should look after his brother and his wife. Then to Kaushalya we find her saying that she should, he should, she should not cry over Rama because he's a good son and, a, and an efficient son. Then to, and then we find that uh, she also is very proud of her son. So of all the three queens, I find that uh, Sumitra is the most noble. Then Sita comes forth. What about as a wife and others is a different thing, but Sita comes forward uh, with her unconditional love for her man. First, uh, she wants to go to the forest and she has logic to prove to Rama that she has to go. Then when Rama considered her to be vile after Lanka, after Ravana's, Ravana attacked her, then 
she think that I will go and prove that I am pure. Then again we find that when Lakshmana tried to leave her in the forest of Valmiki, she said that I do understand the Rama. And last of all, when she was again asked to give a proof of her purity, she again did it. But in all the cases, what we find special in her is a love towards her than Rama. This is what makes her special. But it is in the women of Lanka that I find a contemporary woman who is fearless and righteous and who stands for it. We have Salama, who is trying to convince Sita that Rama is not dead, who says that even when a Ravana is there as my king, I try to protect you and I see that no harm comes to you. It is Trijata who tries to convince the Sita that her Rama is not dead, and it is Mandodari who we find it at, saying that Ravana is not good, and she says he is not good, and she is saying, here we find that she is crying, that she did tell Ravana that he shouldn't do all these things. So it is in the Lankan women we find that they are standing for righteousness, a company of another woman, and the fearlessness. So what I wanted to say is that each woman character demonstrates how within the need of undeniable facticity, one develops, builds, and reveals one's own distinct personality. We have limitations. We are restricted, and within that, we do develop, and we do reveal our own characters. These characters, why are they appealing? These characters stay appealing, as every woman can see in them, and they're living lives, her own self. In actuality and in potentiality, the ladies in Ramayana are not from the past. They are living now in the present, in their new environment, and in the new incarnation. So thank you. The house is open for their questions. Any questions? that are traditionally deemed masculine and that therefore the, the partisanship behind this, the, the, the opinion behind this is actually masculine good feminine not so good thank you sir i do agree with that <laughs> and actually that is what i was trying to say that koike I, I i will never call her as a good or a bad woman but within restrictions that she had to preserve herself and she enjoyed the importance and the way open to her is was uh, through her husband and through her son so she did what she thought was the best to preserve herself. And I do not comment from that it is a bad or it is a good thing. That is the way a woman of the past preserved, and this is the way we are preserving ourselves within the facticity within which we grew up. And, uh, I, do, and I will not say, that is why I will not say that Ahalya is bad. I will not say Kalke is bad, because saying that would be commenting or judging on the basis of a masculine standard. Thank you, sir. I think it's a very good question. I just wanted to make a little comment on that. Yes. We, there are so much of martial arts. But in Assam, the women don't participate. Their dance is very feminine. While as the men have very vigorous dancing. Is that a reflection upon uh, a ma masculine uh, power more strong than the women being weaker? 
my man couldn't get the first part of your question. See, what I'm trying to say is, if it's a mas I mean, strong masculine society, mm. it is reflected in your martial arts also. Mm. Right? I know of uh, dancers, taru dance and all. The men have very vigorous dances. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, sword dance and things like that. But the women always have something very feminine, very delicate. First of all, ma'am, I think the sword dance you are referring to must be the dance from Manipur. Because basically, Assam doesn't have anything specific, a man's dance. But still, I would say, we haven't, uh, we haven't come to the stage yet where we, where we can talk about, uh, uh, talk about the power of a woman as revealed in the culture or in dance. It's not there. It's not there, ma'am. But the, I, I, I am having a feeling but the, because that the dance you are referring to must be Manipur because they have the sword dance. Must be. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to the first uh, one point that you mentioned. I'm not uh, actually well versed with what you were discussing or what ma'am has asked, but I would like to mention the Kalari Payatu of Kerala. It's a martial dance in which uh, the ladies are actually performing and it's proper martial dance. IGNCA has an advantage of documenting. Uh, it's per perhaps Lakshmi Amman. She is 75 years old and she's an exponent of this dance form. So I, I'm not sure what you were discussing, but as I heard this, I thought this Thank is Thank you, ma'am, for the information. But basically I was trying to say that in Ramayana also the woman that we see I, uh, that is what I was saying to sir, I do not like to comment as a Kaikei bad or a Halya bad, but because they are the ways uh, through which actually a woman preserves herself in her own way. So, and when we make a judgment, we'll be making a judgment from the masculine point of view or from the patriarchal point of view. And I was trying to, uh, trying to look at the woman as she comes forth, not as good or bad, but as a woman, in herself, of course, related to somebody, but in herself. This was my aim. But uh, thank you, ma'am, for the information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shakuntala, for this beautiful presentation. Now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Kunrat Ayers, a scholar of angelology, Belgian, to please come over the dais and uh, enlighten us about why goddesses triplets in the Vedas just like elsewhere. Yes, uh, good afternoon. <coughs> we are going to do a little comparison, but that's not the main point. Uh, but it gives us some ideas to compare the Indian situation with uh, several other mythologies. Now, I know from experience that among Hindus, quite a few strongly dislike the idea of comparison because that means that you demean Hindu traditions by putting them at the same height as the others, which is not what they deserve. So it detracts from the unicity of the Vedas. Well, not necessarily. When you say that someone has brothers and sisters, it doesn't preclude him excelling them, being better than them, you know. Um, so nevertheless, you know, whatever the qualities of Vedic tradition, I say it is part of a genealogical tree, that is to say it has relatives. And um, these are primarily uh, of the Indo-European cultures, but also go beyond that, and we'll see an example of that. Um, 
there is a universal sexual symbolism, and in all these modern talks about um, uh, re-evaluating women and the feminine aspects and qualities and so on, they are like supremely unoriginal because ultimately they always fall back into the well-established age-old universal pattern and it comes down to this. Um, when I say that the male is active, what is the female then? Ah, you see in very many, <laughs> in very many books you will see female passive. Now, um, when I studied uh, the Chinese worldview, yin and yang, um, a, not the Chinese, but the Western interpreter came up with a really good idea. He said, you see, that the right term is not passive, it is destructive, that is to say, building something. And the comparison is, of course, the arch comparison between men and women, namely that of pregnancy. You see, it is the man who sets the whole thing in motion, that's active, and it is the woman who does the whole thing, which is destructive. That's not passive. Okay. Um, you have the notion now, uh, heaven versus earth, that's quite universal, Father, heaven, Mother, earth. The sun and the moon, so the moon you will see some complications. Uh, fire versus water, um, the floating versus uh, the movement upwards, like the fire. Um, the straight versus the curved, the hard versus the soft, and the notion of hierarchy versus equality. Men always form a structure with someone at the top, whereas women don't. In fact, there is a, um, a really beautiful German dance called the Stern Polka, the Star Polka, and it consists of six men who dance together, holding each other and forming a structure. And then the women dance around them, and at one point in the dance they form a couple with one of them. Then that stops, then they go around again, then whoever they are with, they form a couple with, and so on. You see, that is symbolic of the, uh, the relation between the sexes traditionally Namely, men form a structure, form a society. One is a blacksmith, and one is a soldier, and one is a doctor, and so on. Whereas women do not form a structure. They only form a couple with one man. And they all do the same thing. Namely, they raise children for that man. That's the traditional, uh, if you for forgive me for mentioning. Um, now, of course, uh, yeah, and this is, this is so, this follows the Chinese principle of yin and yang. Yang means the sunny side of a hill, so it means brightness, like a peacock. And yin means the shadow side of a hill, it means dullness, grayness, like a pea hen. Um, however, you can complicate it a little. Um, the moon is also masculine in, compared to the, in comparison to the stars. The moon is a hunter who moves from day to day to yet a new nakshatra, whereas the nakshatras are just waiting uh, till the man, I mean the moon comes. Um, so there you have the moon as dynamic, the constellations as static. That's also a, a polarity between male and female. But then you have the opposite polarity also, you have to watch out. Symbolism is a complex thing, you know, it's not always obvious. Uh, in ballroom dancing, for example, the woman moves a whole lot more than the man. I mean, both of them move, but she moves a lot more, and it is he who leads her. And so he has to concentrate on leading her and making sure that they don't bump into the next couple and so on. They, he, have to, he has to have an overview, whereas the woman simply has to concentrate on performing the movement that he instructs her to do. Um, so that is uh, like um, Shiva and Shakti. You see there, Shiva is the static factor and Shakti the dynamic one. Um, so Shakti or Prakriti 
is um, what is called in physics matter energy, both matter and energy. Whereas Purusha, the masculine pole, um, is uh, consciousness. Now consciousness doesn't move, doesn't go anywhere. It has the world of matter energy uh, to do that for him. Um, consciousness is indivisible, is one, whereas nature is many and can recombine and do all kinds of things. <coughs> uh, in the Sankhya scheme of things, nature can be divided first into three, three guna, the three qualities, then into 24, 24 tapas, symbolized in the Indian flag by the wheel, you know, one at the center, Purusha, and 24 around. And, and in principle, uh, many more. There is another interesting difference. You would say that the masculine means solid and the feminine means, well, chaotic and so on. But not exactly, or not always. Um, uh, in the masculine pole, you have a form called Ardhana Rishwara. In fact, I, I'm sure half the speakers at this conference will bring up Ardhana Rishwara. But uh, me too, I know better. So uh, I want to remark that um, uh, you do have Ardhana Rishwara. You know, you have the male who is also female, but you do not have the other, the, the counterpart. You do not have an Ardhana Rishwari, as it would be, the goddess who is also half male. Um, and that corresponds to a biological reality. You see, women have XX chromosomes, you know, they are solid. That's also why women survive much better as children and so on, having childhood diseases and so on. Boys uh, fall by the wayside, whereas girls survive. Uh, so in boys it is XY, which is a more precarious combination. So masculinity is something you know, to be earned constantly, to be tested constantly, and so on, it is very uncertain. There is also in law a principle called, um, and now I hope you bring all out your best Latin, um, uh, pater incertus, mater semper certa. This means the father is uncertain, the mother is always certain. So you see, in that sense, to, um, Masculinity is something very fragile, whereas femininity is something very solid. Okay. It so happens that goddesses in pantheons across the world come in three songs. Like the three graces, like the three norns in Scandinavian mythology, the destiny goddesses. These three, in their case, is simply the past, the present, and the future. Um, or you have three times three, um, you know, nine is also an interesting mystic number and it is very much associated with goddesses, uh, like a magic square that has nine squares on it, uh, like the nine muses in Greece, or in India, Navaratri, the nine nights of the goddess. Um, so to, just to illustrate that it exists the world over, uh, on the other side, you have a, a Scandinavian symbol called a Valknut. And so that's three interlaced triangles. That's more or less the same symbol with more or less the same meaning as Triguna in India, which we will see shortly. Um, and and it, I'm also showing it because it shows the step from three to nine three triangles in nine. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now let's go into some uh, Vedic verse. Uh, you all know, I suppose, the Murtyun Jaya Mantra, right? It was uh, written by Vasishta of the seventh book of the Rig Veda. Um, Western scholars criticize it as an interpolation. They do so since the 19th century in the 2014 translation by Jamison and Brereton, it is still there. They reject it as an interpolation for two reasons. Uh, it has the notion of renunciation. You see, it says, 
Um, we worship Triambaka. I'll explain Triambaka in a moment. So we worship Triambaka, um, who is a uh, well-smelling and growth-promoting, um, just like a cucumber from its ties, namely its ties to the, the, the branch of a tree. So fruits are hanging from branches of trees, yes. And so when they are ripe, they automatically lose their connection and they fall down, right? Um, so just like a cucumber coming free from its ties to, to its branch, uh, let me be freed from death, right? Now, that implies the notion of renunciation, you know, comparing to how the cucumber renounces, so to speak, the tree from which it's hanging. And also they say that there is no concept yet of a three-eyed god. Now, Triambakam is usually translated as the three-eyed one, also in, in their translation. And some scholars speculate that um, since Vyasa, who was a descendant of Vasishta, controlled the editing of the Veda, that he smuggled in this verse and attributed it falsely to his ancestor Vasishta, because at, at that time this verse had become very famous and very popular and so on, and he wanted to rival his own ancestors, rival Vishwamitra. And Vishwamitra is the author of the Gayatri Mantra. So, you see, to sort of rival the famous Gayatri Mantra, he also wanted to attribute a famous you know, verse to his own ancestor, because in those days ancestry was very important. So that's what they say. Now I think they are wrong. Um, I have not yet met one interpolation in the Vedas of which scholars say it's an interpolation that holds up to this view. Um, like the Purusha Sukta, for instance, they have always said that is an interpolation. I can show that it is not, and that all the reasons why they give for that are not valid. It's a different subject. But you can read my book, um, Hindu Dharma and the Culture Wars. There is a chapter about Purusha Sukta in which I explain it all. Anyway, now back to this one. Um, so it's a strange reasoning to meet a certain theme in a book and say, ah, you know, that, that cannot be there because that theme wasn't there. No, it's, a, it's the contrary. The, the presence of that verse proves that that theme already existed. And indeed, you do find it elsewhere, like, for instance, in the famous Riddle Hymn by Dirga Tamas, uh, book 1.164. Uh, um, where the famous comparison is made of two birds sitting in a tree. One is eating the berries and one just looks on. That's also a symbol of renunciation. You see, he foregoes the pleasures of, that nature has to offer. Um, and then no third eye concept yet. Well, again, you see, here we see precisely that that was already there. Or maybe it wasn't. And now I come to another <coughs> variant translation, which was not given by just anyone. I have it from uh, Swami Veda Bharati, who died two, two three years ago, uh, from Rishikesh. And um, so he says, but Triambaka doesn't mean with the three eyes, it means with the three mothers. And that's strange. Now, as for the translation, that is not that controversial. Amba means mother. Um, with the three mothers, well, you see the word mother in many languages, especially in India, is often simply used for a woman. And, you know, you very often address a woman as mother. And so, um, this simply means that uh, the god Shiva is associated with three women. And these women may take the title of mother or wife or daughter, whatever, but with three women. Now, what does this signify? So, Shiva is, among many other things, a moon god, Chandra Dara. He has the moon in his uh, hair, uh, which 
reminds you of horns of a bull. You see, over here, when the moon is a crescent, you see it lying down like a boat, or indeed like the horns of a bull. In Europe, you see it on the side. Uh, but here it is, it is a meaningful symbolism. Um, so, um, that refers to three phases of the moon. The Vivi's daughters are three phases of the moon, namely the very first crescent after the new moon, the full moon, and then the last crescent. In fact, the crescent means a growing moon, so a waning moon, let's say a waning sickle. Um, yeah. And it is uh, explicitly uh, connected to the triple goddess in the Vedas, mostly in the Atharva Veda, uh, namely Gungu or Kuhu, the beginning moon, Sinivali, the full moon, and Raka, the last moon. So it's also once in the Rig Veda there, the imagery not that explicit, but you know that it's the same three goddesses, Gungu, Sinivali, and Raka. Um, you have other triplets of goddesses like Bharati, Illa, and Saraswati, uh, also uh, repeatedly used. Um, but so to go back to this moon theme, uh, you know, there you have a very obvious symbolism of the moon god who has three women, so to speak, who has three phases. Uh, you find this elsewhere, for example, in. Um, in Mecca, uh, before Muhammad cleared the Kaaba of the 360 gods that were depicted there, it was uh, vowed to the god Hubal, who was a moon god just like Shiva. And um, I mean, some Hindus say, oh, the Kaaba was originally a Shiva temple. That's not exactly true, but it is somewhat true in the sense that. You know, Hubal and Shiva are more or less the same. And so he has three daughters, Allat, Al Uza, and Manat. There you have precisely the same symbolism. Incidentally, when Mahmoud Ghaznavi came in the neighborhood of the Somna temple, he per se wanted to destroy it because the Arabs had the notion that after Muhammad destroyed the gods, the gods of Arabia, they fl fled to the Somna temple that they were still hiding there. Um, right. Or you see among neo-pagans in Europe nowadays, you have the notion of what they call the horn god and the triple goddess. That's the same uh, symbolism. And so because of Hubal, who was a moon god, uh, you see he had the symbolism of the moon and that carried over into Islam. And that's why the moon has become the symbol of Islam, like of Pakistan. So, last one. Um, there is a deeper meaning to these three songs. You see, the moon is all very visible and so on. That's like, that's like primitive polytheism. But there is a deeper philosophical layer, and that's not everywhere. That is like typical for Hinduism. When Western scholars read the Vedas, they say, oh, it is puerile, to use a term used by Max Müller. You know, it is primitive and so on. It is the childhood state of mankind. And then later in the, in the Upanishads, they became more philosophical, they became profounder. Well, I wouldn't underestimate the Vedas. And so many of the um, deeper philosophical concepts that only come to, through, to fruition in, in later Hinduism are essentially already there. Like, for instance, the Vajra, the lightning, which in, in Tibetan Buddhism is a symbol of, like, instant enlightenment. Well, that is the weapon of Indra, as you know, the thunder god who, you know, throws the, the lightning. And so some of that meaning is already there. You shouldn't take too simplistic a view of Indra. Or, for instance, Indra is credited with the power of taking any shape. Uh, we just heard about Ahalya, 
And so, as you know, I mean, the, you heard what happened to Ahalya later, but the beginning of the story is that she was seduced by Indra. And how did Indra do it? Well, he took the shape of her husband. And so, you know, she didn't mean to be unfaithful. She thought she was doing it with her husband, but it was Indra. And so, you see, there you see a sort of jocular application of this basic theme that gods can take any shape they want. Now, this image of taking any shape they want is the basis of the later philosophical concept of maya. What else is maya but the fact that everything you see is a shape which the divine, the absolute, has taken. Hmm? Right. Um, so here also, you saw these three songs. Um, you know, before you get to three, you first have two, okay? Now here you have a radical polarity, namely the polarity between Purusha and Prakriti, between consciousness and matter energy. And that's a male-female polarity in, you know, imagery. I mean, there is ultimately nothing male or female about this divine stuff. You see, this is abstract. There is nothing male or female about a triangle or a square, you know. But, you know, you can, like an inverted triangle is imagined as a female symbol. Yeah, 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 I'm almost there. Um, you know, but so that's a manner of speaking. And so a lot of this, uh, all this talk nowadays about, you know, reevaluating the goddess and like for instance in Christianity, you have a thing called theology. You know, you have theology, which is about God, and theology is about the goddess. You see, I think this is all much ado about nothing. <laughs> because after all, the divine has no sex. In fact, there is a woman in uh, the Mahabharata, and now I, I don't forget her name. Uh, she's also sort of uh, a yogi. And in fact, you know, she shows her CDs or her powers when she meets uh, King Janaka. And so, you know, Janaka says, you know, you, you have the afternoon time to find a place in town where you can stay. And she comes back by sunset and she says, well, I haven't found a good place. Anyway, the real place I want to stay is in your head. And then she, you know, she spends the night in his head. You know, this is just one of these CDs. Anyway. Um, but far more importantly, this woman has a debate with Janaka in which she shows, you see, the Atma, which some people represent as masculine, has no sex. You know, it is just, it's just universal and it's just as much applicable to men as to women. Right? And so, okay, anyway, so let's uh, wind up here by saying that you know, you have this fundamental polarity, consciousness has no dimensions, has no color, you know, the essential colorlessness of the absolute. Um, by contrast, nature is many, is differentiated, has many colors, you know, summed up in white, black, and red, or in sattva, tamas, and rajas. So you have the triguna world, which is the universe, and you have the Nirguna world, which is the world of pure consciousness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gulbar.